Dr. Adalja, I don't know if you heard the governor of South Carolina there. I thought his logic was circuitous, uh, to say the least. What does a grizzled pro like you think when you hear politicians, lawyers, former prosecutors, history majors from the University of South Carolina play scientist? How do you respond to that? Well, what we want is the state's public health guidance to reflect the science of COVID-19, the epidemiology of COVID-19, and the best practices. And I do think it has to be a priority that schools be open for in-person learning. And I think it can be done safely. We knew how to do this even in the pre-vaccine era. So I think that many governors are wrestling with this question as Delta variant cases rise largely because of the unvaccinated population that frustratingly still doesn't get vaccinated in many of these states, which makes it more difficult and complicated to open schools. But I think we can do this, and it should be something that, that needs to be done. But it has to reflect the epidemiology and the reality of transmission in each state or each school district. Are you impatient that we haven't gotten to what I'm going to call full FDA approval of the mRNA vaccines? Is, that, is impatience warranted? Definitely, impatience is, is warranted. We know that this is, this is a, a vaccine that's been given to hundreds of millions of people all around the world, that we have a lot of safety data, a lot of efficacy data, and that the FDA, even though they're doing a priority review, that's not fast enough, because we know this is something that's holding back people from getting vaccinated, because many people keep using this claim that because these are available on an emergency use authorization only, that somehow this is experimental, and it's leading to vaccine hesitancy. The other issue is, is that many companies and organizations are reticent to mandate the vaccine until it's fully FDA approved, because they feel they're on stronger footing when they do so. So both of those things are getting held back because the FDA hasn't approved this. They say it's probably going to happen this month. It needs to happen basically today. The quicker this happens, the better it is. We can't allow bureaucracy to slow vaccine uptake, and that's exactly what What's happening. Amish, you said that it should be a priority to reopen schools in person for learning. A lot of people would agree with you. You said it was possible to do this even in the pre-vaccine era. Does that process include shutting down classes or sending people home who've been in contact with people who have COVID, which could be particularly disruptive? Definitely there, there's going to be disruption if you're in an area that has high community transmission because they're going to be exposure. But what we want to do in schools is design them in such a way that the classroom doesn't lead to exposures, that people are not six, that, that if you've got a place where there's high community prevalence, you've got to be very careful about where you seat children, what types of activities they're participating in. And what we know is that the exposures and infections that occurred in schools in the pre-vaccine era were largely not due to sitting in the classroom. They were extracurricular activities, sports, for example, cheerleading, uh, other uh, uh, dances, those types of things are where we saw exposure happen. So schools need to prioritize the pedagogical role. So you, you need to have algebra class be the priority, not being being uh, on time for football practice. And that's something that didn't happen so much during the school year in the past. And I think we can try and minimize those exposures so you don't have to quarantine students. And it's easier to do this now because we can, we can actually have all the teachers vaccinated. That could actually be something school districts mandate. And children above the age of 12 have the ability to be vaccinated. So... And, and we also have other uh, other uh, mitigation measures like masking for unvaccinated children, masking for high risk activity. So I think we can we can do this because we know that the children suffered a lot during this last school year, not because of what the virus did to them, but what adults did to them and what teachers unions did to them. Dr. Adalja, just moving aside from the politics of reopening the schools, there's also a question of the message from the FDA, the question, the message from the CDC, and how consistent it has been in order to get some of the confidence confidence, uh, the reputational support in the community that it needs. Do you think that it has undermined its message by sending conflicting signals over the past few months? De definitely. When you look at the way the CDC guidance has changed in their messaging, first they undersold the vaccines, then then they moved quickly and people didn't understand where that came from. I actually supported the change in the guidance that fully vaccinated people did not need to wear masks. And then they changed it again based on a study from Provincetown, Massachusetts, which isn't necessarily extrapolable to the everyday life of vaccinated people. So this messaging that goes back and forth where people are unclear what the, what the actual truth of, of, of a message is, or the, especially in a 
sea of misinformation that they have on social media, all of that makes it very hard for the average person to a actually trust public health authorities. And this is a major problem that's going to have cascading impacts past COVID-19, that the public health communication strategy is something that really was flawed and something that made our ability to respond to this pandemic much worse. Doctor, shouldn't we be looking to the UK? Is that a decent template for what could happen here? And why aren't we doing that? We definitely should be looking at the UK because what they've done is vaccinated enough people that even with Delta variant cases rising, they did not have a concomitant rise in hospitalizations and deaths. And that's that decoupling that we talked about, which has been achieved in many states, but not all states. But I do think that we have to come to a point where we approach this like a, a respiratory virus that we know is going to be with us for forever, basically. This is not, it's not sustainable to shut and open things. We've got to come up with a path where people are vaccinated and we remove the ability of the virus to threaten hospital capacity, but then we teach people how to risk calculate and understand what are the best practices for keeping COVID-19 from disrupting your organization. Yeah. And, and a, a lot of what we've done so far has been abstinence only and not the harm reduction that we really need to, to show people how to live with this virus that's going to be a seasonal coronavirus uh, soon.